All right, we are going to get started. Um, well, one of the big issues uh, we're all examining is how do we create a seamless transition from our early learning programs to kindergarten and beyond. And we're fortunate uh, to have with us today some outstanding leaders from the Anoka Hennepin and the Bloomington School Districts who will share some of their experiences and their expertise in this area. Um, I'm going to welcome them and we're going to have them both do their um, presentations and then we'll take questions after they're both done. So please welcome Dr. Mary Wolverton, Steve Carr, who are both from Anoka Hennepin, Dr. David Heisted, who's been to AMSD several times, and Tom Holton to the stand. Thank you. I should probably give this caveat for both of our school districts. Neither of us would pretend to be the experts nor have all the answers, nor would our work can be completely done. So I'll do that, and then we'll share with you some of our, our pathways. A little grounding piece. In most of our school districts, we have um, four primary tools for working with our early, early learning populations that deal with preschool screening, the early childhood special ed, school readiness, and early childhood family education. In Anoka Hennepin, we've created a program called Kindergar Kindergarten Readiness Preschool that we add to that. One of the issues we've had over the years is we've had declining funding for these programs. Um, in school readiness, for example, we've been not had a funding increase since 1991. In early childhood family ed, it's since 2003. Those have hampered our ability to respond to the changing demographics that we've experienced in our school district with increasing poverty um, and diversity in our school district and just responding to those kinds of needs. So those, those have been very difficult. So at times in Anoka Hennepin, I felt a little bit like the church pastor where I was walking around passing the hat and trying to make these things work and serve the families. And I'm sure many of you have had the same kind of experience. Um, for us, and there are in each of the districts, and I th as Tom and I have sh shared some of our discussion, there's kind of those catalyst moments that help move you forward as a school district. For us, um, we had been doing um, in community education a kindergarten readiness preschool pilot for a number of years along with our, our school readiness. And what we did is we had children who were in high poverty, special needs, or ELL, who were in that pilot. And we were working with those children and we were having some very good success in preparing those children for kindergarten. The other key piece for us in terms of moving forward were leadership discussions. Discussions between myself and Dr. Wolverton about what could we do if we started working more tightly together in K-12 and our pre-K programs and, and moving and maximizing and aligning the kind of resources that we had. So those discussions occurred over some time. And then kind of the one that pushed us a little bit over the top was the literacy aid revenue for us. In our district we said we don't want to get into the trap of saying, well, here, we just got this new money, so we're going to go settle a teacher's contract with it. That's clearly not. We wanted to do something that we made some strategic investments in our school district that got at closing the achievement gap, getting kids ready for school, and so we made some decisions. So some of those strategic investments were that we increased our all-day K sites, and we aligned those sites with, at that time, our AYP schools. The second component that we did is increase the number of kindergarten readiness preschool sites. And again, those would be the sites where the high intensity services for those students. And those students were then attending school 167 days a year, bus transportation, uh, those kinds of support structures to, so to serve those kids. And again, the, the eligibility was based on poverty, ELL, or special ed. Mary, I think this is your piece. Thank you, Steve. Um, when I took this position um, that I'm currently in about six years ago, in our district for years we had had um, a, a committee set up or established um, called our Early Childhood um, Cabinet. And so I observed that cabinet for a couple of years and um, kind of did an analysis of are we really meeting our intended outcomes and Steve and I started talking and decided we really needed to do a paradigm shift in not only how we worked but then how we pushed our work out into the system so we dismantled the early childhood learning cabinet and instead reassembled a new committee called our pre-k three committee pre-k three committee and what we really started doing is looking at it from a systems perspective 
on how we are attaining our intended outcomes. And I would say earlier in the morning when Mr. Burham um, spoke to, it's really not about just having students ready for kindergarten. It goes much further than that. The re uh, recent legislation on world's best for workforce really supports, I think, the thinking that all of us have in relation to the student populations we serve. So what we started looking at in that is we started doing an analysis of our data. And all of us know that when we look at third grade proficiency, the national research on third grade proficiency and the correlation to high school success and college readiness is um, pretty st statistically significant. So we started looking at our third grade proficiency in our district and started drilling down the data and looking at um, correlations to data systems within our district. And we started seeing a pretty significant correlation to students that met the end of year benchmarks in kindergarten had a strong correlation to third grade proficiency. Then we started going and looking a little bit deeper in relation to, okay, who are our kids that are reaching end of year benchmarks for kindergarten on the state standards? And we started getting at, I think something Steve and I will talk about a little bit more, is what that meant to be kindergarten ready. So being kindergarten ready really does matter in relation to how those students' academic careers may or may not go once they're in the system. So when we uh, uh, aligned our leadership group, um, we started looking at it from early childhood and kin uh, elementary leadership all being at the same table and redefining how we worked. So in our leadership planning group, we had early childhood special education leaders, we had staff from community ed, we had kindergarten readiness supervisors and directors, and then I had, um, we had the elementary curriculum director and some of our curriculum teaching and learning specialists. And in that, um, you'll see on this slide, we started talking about some of the big ideas that we really needed to define and address before we started going to our, our level of work out into the system. So in that, it was really a lot of learning that was happening both ways. We learned a lot from what was happening in early childhood, having those cross-level conversations. And I think the same learning went vice versa with them having a deeper understanding of what was happening in kindergarten. In that, in the very early stages, we started talking about how our curriculum either aligns or doesn't align for our students when they leave early childhood and come into the K um, programming. And then the other piece that we started looking at that was a significant flaw in our system is that we didn't have a significant plan for data collection and for tracking assessment data and how our students were performing from early childhood into the elementary program. So we started working with information systems, with other departments, technology to start defining those systems before we shifted to the next level. And then we started talking about, okay, how does this look in relation to cross-level um, professional development and how we can start um, increasing those conversations. Mm -hmm. So as Steve mentioned, our school board uh, was very, very supportive of taking that literacy financial aid and investing it in early childhood and in our kindergarten programming. So one of the first things we did is we hired a teaching and learning specialist with a strong background in kindergarten and early childhood experiences. And she started working with both levels in relation to aligning our curriculum and our assessment systems, as well as our programming for our students. And in that, we started cross-level conversations um, in our district, um, in all levels, elementary and secondary, we use understanding by design in relation to aligning um, state standards to uh, curriculum resources that we use in instruction. So what we started doing is started to work with um, early childhood educators in looking at and understanding our kindergarten curriculum documents and more importantly, our state standards. And then we started also looking at what early childhood was using with their teaching standard goals for assessment. So there was learning happening both ways. And in that, we did a strong integration of elementary 
elementary principals being at the table and having a deep understanding of what was happening in early childhood. Um, and then I would say with kindergarten state standards, not only was the learning happening with early childhood, having an understanding of what those standards are, but what we did is we had um, our teaching and learning specialists, as well as our math recovery leader and our reading recovery leader working with early childhood as we unpacked the state standards so they really understood what each standard meant in relation to supporting their work and aligning our work. And then we also did that same thing with our kindergarten benchmarks and with our assessments. So then our work began. And one of the things that I think has been uh, the most exciting for every one of us that have been involved in this is we've really developed a new team in the district in relation to how we do our work. And so now in our district, we don't think of early childhood and elementary as being separate. We work together. And so in that, um, we really started out, um, I'm going to actually start with the second bullet. Um, in our district, all elementary principals have gone through the Minnesota Principals Academy. We started working with Kent Pakel a number of years ago. And in that, we decided that when we pulled that group of administrators together, it was critical to have the early childhood directors and supervisors at the table as well. So all principals and early childhood staff were working together going through the Minnesota Principals Academy. The second piece that just started evolving naturally from that process was any professional development that I'll bring forward for elementary principals, it's elementary principals and early childhood educators. So one of our big movements in our district right now is looking at how do we, um, how do we establish a successful classroom management and learning environments for our students. So many of our schools, if not all, are moving towards Envoy training um, with Michael, based on Michael Gridner's work, and early childhood is embracing that as well. The other piece that we've done is um, we work with a national consultant from Solution Tree, Dr. Sharon Kramer, on professional learning communities. I think we're in our fourth or fifth year in working with her. Early childhood has been working with elementary principals on that as well. So you can kind of see that common theme that staff development is not about two different levels, it's about one level. Then the piece that was really exciting is in the summer, we have for two weeks in the summer, we offer our staff uh, something called Summer Institute. We have different sessions, kind of a arena style or a menu of conferences they can attend. And so we, what we started establishing several years ago on Summer Institute was professional development for pre-K, our kindergarten readiness teachers and kindergarten teachers. So the teachers working with the students are receiving professional development together. And the, the uh, intended outcome um, that we've had from that is that it has really increased a deeper understanding of both levels and the work that's happening in both of those um, supports for students respectfully. The other piece that has happened with that, particularly in our co-located sites, which we've increased substantially in our districts, is that um, early childhood educators are shadowing kindergarten teachers and vice versa. So when our kindergarten, our kindergarten readiness students enter kindergarten in the co-located sites, they already have a deep understanding of not only the school, but they also have a deep awareness and understanding of the teachers and the teachers vice versa with them. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this was probably, if there was any pressure point in this shift in practice, it was right here. So what, we, what I had mentioned earlier is we started setting up systems so that we could do strong analysis of data. And um, that's, I think, a relatively, was a relatively new piece on the level that we were asking teachers and principals to do in relation to kindergarten. It was also a pressure point for early childhood educators in relation to what we were looking at. So in that, we really um, had a strong system set up so that um, we had all of our data in viewpoint 
And just recently, we've been able to get all of our students that are in kindergarten readiness. That data is also in the same system. So if I'm a kindergarten teacher and I have a student that was in a kindergarten readiness program, I can see the data that was collected on that student um, in the kindergarten readiness program as well. The other piece that we're doing, and I see um, Ben is in the room from Ties. I, I don't know if Ben is still here. <laughs> um, but in our district, um, we have been working for a number of years on data dashboards. And so um, we have done quite a bit of work at the elementary level with um, the University of Minnesota. We're working with Dr. Ted Christ um, in the educational psychology department using FAST um, assessment systems as formative assessment systems for teachers. And so in that, we have all of our kindergarten teachers doing data collection. We piloted it last year. This year, we implemented it in all 24 schools. And so in that, all of the teachers are doing their data collection using FAST with their iPads. And then it links to not only Viewpoint, but also Principal Dashboards and My Dashboard. In fact, yesterday I was able to go online and see where are all of our students in relation to the assessments that we took this fall. Why is that important? It helps me in my conversations with supporting not only ad the administrators, but in aligning resources to those schools that really need additional supports. Um, the other piece that we've done with the aligning of data that really became a pressure point is, is in our district, um, in kindergarten and in first grade, uh, we're working with U of M on that as well, we have an assessment that we use called Concepts of Math. It's really kind of based on the Math Recovery Advantage Math Recovery System. And um, what we had done in the past is we had always collected that data and really not put that in front of teachers to the level that we should. So about a year and a half ago, um, I think the spring of 2012, we pulled all of that data and not only shared it with all principals by school, but we also shared it with all teachers by school. And uh, I'll show you that data in a little bit, but that wasn't, um, Spring of 2012 wasn't an exciting time for me because people were not happy with looking at the data. But spring of, uh, I mean, spring of 2011, spring of 2012, people were pretty thrilled. Um, and then in that, as they started looking at their data, we really started talking about a shift to first best instruction, aligning standards to the results. And, and we'll talk about that a little later in another slide. And this would be no fun if you didn't see some kids, so. The Kindergarten Readiness Preschool Program was created to really target kids with the risk factor of poverty, plus um, other risk factors like uh, having unidentified special needs, being homeless, but other things that we know affect learning before kindergarten. This is the age where you need to catch them on some of those skills before it becomes a struggle. We kind of have aligned our goals with the kindergarten goals so that when they go to kindergarten, they have the skills to progress through the kindergarten goals. What's nice is that there's just so much exposure to so many different things. When they came in, they could maybe count to 12, and now they can count to 25. We've seen huge growth in writing their name. And you can see them just blossom throughout the year and just grow so much more confident um, in their abilities. Another big piece of this is a social interaction. Their ability to listen to directions, learning how to take turns, and learning how to work with another student if they have a disagreement. They're more comfortable in a school setting than they were in the fall. Kids who come with those risk factors may start much lower than, than their same aged peers, but because of being a part of this program, by the time they're done, they are at that same level or even exceeding that level of their same aged peers. But the learning and achievement gap it starts before kids ever get to kindergarten. So that this program can target and meet those, those needs before kids um, even begin school is really critical. And what we've seen in terms of our results are outstanding. That was Mary Lee Christensen Adams, who's my early childhood person. And uh, stories don't mean anything unless you have some data. So we'll give you a little data here too. 
This is from our kindergarten readiness preschool program. Um, the dark blue would be where we would like the kids to be in terms of their readiness skills um, for success in kindergarten. This was of the fall assessment when the kids came in. Uh, we, we assess the kids across these six areas and I think what I'll just ask you to note a little bit because it plays in a little bit later. Look at math. When we talk about where kids are coming in in terms of their math skills, um, only about 7% of the kids were, were at a kindergarten ready level when they joined us in the fall. So when you think of how in our school districts we've struggled around math um, in some of these issues, you think, well, okay, well, we're starting from a different point, which led us to a strategy, which you'll see a little bit later. This is the good news. This is spring. So this is what we were pretty proud of. Um, to say we move these kids, these, these kids on to kindergarten, and they should be to, doing pretty well. And we're seeing some of that evidence this fall as they came in. So at the elementary level, our end of year assessment that we look for a benchmark is the developmental reading assessment. And as we started putting data in front of students, I mean in front of teachers, in the spring of 2012, uh, we had 58.5% of our students attaining the year, end of year benchmark. In the spring of 2013, we increased that by almost 20%. Our concepts of math was the area that staff hadn't really looked at the data and did the analysis of that. We increased that by 30%. Um, in the spring of 2012, when they looked at their data, they were not happy. Um, they noted that we really need to have developmentally appropriate kindergartens. What we talked about is how you do developmentally appropriate instruction to align to the state standards. What we know here in this is it creates a pressure point for both Steve and um, for myself and our leaders. We have cohorts of students now that we can't lose that momentum. So we know that the students that came into kindergarten this year, we had to change our cut scores for emerging and developing on concepts of math because kids were coming in at higher levels. We know that now our students that are in first grade, that cohort of students is a different cohort of students and we need to shift our instruction. So we're not only working with kindergarten teachers to continue that momentum, but now we're working pretty significantly with first grade staff because they have a different population of students in front of them. And obviously, you don't make progress without engaging the child's first uh, teacher, which is the parent. So we did a number of things to try to engage, and there's still a lot of work to do in this arena. But what we did with our kindergarten readiness kids is we had home visits. So each teacher visited the home of these children. And this year, we've added some additional home visits because we had so much success with the families and their engagement as a result. We were also adding additional parent conferences. We had parent conferences, but we had such great um, positive things that happened as a part of that that we've added some additional parent conferences this year. We have always had checkout materials, um, take home kinds of activities for, for families to do with the kids and engage the kids. As well as then we've done a tremendous amount of outreach around information at registration events, doctor's offices, all kinds of places you can imagine um, in terms of what's going on. And then I think the, the last piece is being more effective at communicating to parents what ki being kindergarten ready in an Okehanapin means, what kinds of skills that their children have to have to come in and be successful so that we can engage them them in our in our work so in that one of the things that our leadership team discovered pretty early on when we started looking at data we were seeing increasing number of students coming into kindergarten who had not gone through early childhood screening and why that was critical for us because we knew we were missing on early interventions with students. So we had a group of us working on an outreach within the Anoka Hennepin School District. And uh, our mail, we created this uh, magnet, kind of a tip line, for a variety of different organizations in our district. And you can see some of them listed there. And mailed those out to, I think we had a mailing list of over 300 different providers and agencies. So really trying to uh, get that outreach to parents and get their students in for early childhood screening so we could connect with them sooner. The other piece, and there was a question asked earlier, um, when our committee started, our group started work, working together, 
one of the things that we first asked ourselves was, what, what does it mean to be kindergarten ready? So we looked at our data, we talked with teachers, we talked with others, and developed, um, defined for families what it meant to be kindergarten ready. This is on our website, um, and it really helped us with that. In that, when we started looking at that, then the next question was, okay, so if I'm a parent and I see that and my kid isn't there, what do I do? And so what we did is we defy, we uh, identified about seven critical points that we thought would be helpful for parents, and we created a video series for a point of family education. We'll just show you a tiny glimpse of one of them on our website, and we have seven that we created. New research suggests that children who have a strong number sense when they begin school achieve greater math success later. Two. One, one, two. To count well, children must learn how to say the number sequence and match each number name with an object. Families can begin this journey by providing lots of modeling for their young mathematicians. All right, will you count those with me? One, two, three, four, thank you. Also, give your young child many opportunities to count in their world. I think probably the biggest thing that parents and families could do to help their children develop number sense would be to have them have their child count, count again and again and again. And when I talk about counting, I'm not talking about just giving that sequence one, two, three, four, five, but having the child count for meaning. How many ponies do you see on the, the carpet over here? How many trees are in our backyard? Let's count and find out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, it is helpful if your child is able to count up to 20 before beginning kindergarten at Anoka Hennepin Schools. Another skill families can help their child with is naming an amount without counting. We as adults do that all the time. We roll a die and we can see, oh my goodness, there's six. And we know that not from counting each little dot on that die, but because we recognize that pattern. So having the child play board games to play with dice helps them um, be able to use that idea as well. You have to get a one to win. Help your child develop a strong number sense. Learn more at anoka.k12.mn.us backslash kindergarten. So as you can see, it's a work in progress, but it is, I think we've at least walked you down some of the journey that we've walked. Um, these are actually some of the kids who are in our kindergarten readiness program, and so this was kind of a fun one to end with. Um, I think we'll turn it over to Bloomington. Thank you, Anoka Hennepin. Uh, I am Tom Holton from Bloomington Richfield Schools. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank AMSD for putting on this conference. And for those of us that have been at this work for a long time, who would have thought that 10 years ago or so, you'd have this sort of a collection of, of legislators, school leaders, early childhood community educators all in the room together, all sharing positive results and positive ways to get things done. So I'd like to thank AMSD for taking the leadership to do this. And then since I know that probably most of you didn't have a chance to read my bio, which wasn't very instructive, uh, before I came up here, uh, the, my best friends at my table and around me and at the break uh, first commented and wanted to know before I came up here, what did I do with the spike when I was done with it? <laughs> and then uh, one of my closest friends pointed out and reminded me that uh, environment, growing up environment has to do with uh, 
how you turn out. And uh, officially, I was raised by a clown. So um, that might uh, help you understand some of my commentary. Of course, in 10 minutes or so, uh, no one can talk about all the great work in early childhood in K3 and aligning the work. And uh, so what I'm going to try to do is give you both a, a somewhat of a highlights reel from Bloomington Richfield and then uh, throw in some of the bloopers or some of the things we ran into that hopefully if you're at, uh, more at the front end of this journey, you can bypass. And uh, some of the things I can skip over, uh, uh, hopefully uh, many of the things we're doing I saw in the presentation in Okehennepin. And I hope if there's nothing else you take away today, that at your tables, the conversations I'm hearing already uh, are the conversations that have to continue, not only in your district, but utilizing the great resources that the Minnesota Department is putting together, all of the research that's being done uh, at the University of Minnesota. But um, the conversation uh, has been going on a long time, uh, but, but uh, today for many of you is just a starting point. Again, there are many frameworks. Uh, you heard about the uh, MDE talking about the framework for de developing early childhood. Uh, and of course, you can spend days, weeks, or years studying those frameworks. But uh, take one and use that and, and understand that each, each district is different, uh, each community is different, and the children and families that come to you are different. So use those frameworks uh, to develop from the point that you are in your district. I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, and and uh, talk about uh, what I hope you leave with my part of the presentation and David following me. Just give you a brief history of where we've been, how we got here, uh, how we built a, a differentiated early childhood model, talk about uh, goals and assessments as the anchor, uh, some of the quality alignment traps, uh, some of the organizational things that we've done, much as uh, Noka Hennepin has done, look a little bit at qu uh, program quality, and then, of course, uh, uh, that all hopefully leads to results, and, and David's going to talk about those in conclusion. So we started um, really what I call our transition in early childhood and integration around 2005. And we had uh, in place uh, many of the, the components of, of what was recognized as good early childhood with ECFE screening and school readiness programs. And our school readiness programs are doing a dang good job of getting kids ready that were on trajectory to be ready already, if that makes sense. <laughs> but Bloomington and Richfield have been changing and continue to change in the families that we see. And by putting those families, even if we could get them, into the programming that we had, did not start eliminating that achievement gap that already existed as we saw our our kids at uh, birth one, two, and three, and certainly at kindergarten, the, the gap already existed. And by putting those same kids into that same kind of programming, we were getting the same results. We were seeing the same gap. We had a, a, a catalyst event for us. Uh, we applied for and received a, a No Child Le Left Behind Early Reading First Grant, and we went from getting our $67 per student for school readiness. That's what we get in Bloomington Richfield. It goes up and down a little bit between the districts. But we were getting $67 to get our children ready. And if we think about that, and Steve mentioned that funding still hasn't changed. Yes, we've made great progress with scholarships, but we're trying to do something on fumes, is what I would call it. But we were awarded this grant and for 90 children, we got to spend, we were mandated to spend $11,000 per student to have all day uh, programming. And along with that, we were required to look at many of the things that Oak Hennepin looked at. What was our curriculum, curriculum? How did it align to the work we were doing in K3? What were we doing with staff development with our teachers? What did our classroom look like in terms of uh, liter literacy rich instruction? Uh, implementing a coaching model for teachers. So instead of just saying you're doing it wrong, we could bring in experts and teach them how to do it right. Uh, being the community educators that we were, our first response to the feds was, well, we want to do 200 or 500 for that. And of course, they said, no, you must spend 11,000 so we can make comparisons across the state. And with that, we were able to have a full day program, five days a week, 
replacing what we tried to do in two days for a couple hours a day. So we not only were able to improve, improve the intensity, but the quality of what we were doing and evaluate those results. And at the end of those three years, we were just astounded by how we could take a three and a four year old that typically poverty and EL typically would be so far behind their counterparts in kindergarten that we could catch them up and make them equal to our average student in Bloomington. And that's in a district where we have a high rate of, of success with all of our students. And so when the grant went away, we said we can't let that, we can't let that go away. We have to do something. We couldn't find the 11,000. Uh, we didn't have a magic to convert $67 into 11,000. So we, we got some people together and said, what do we do? And so we put some funding sources together and, and, and looking back, uh, it isn't until now that I realize um, when the, all of the funding sources were showed this summer, uh, Arnie Duncan came to see uh, uh, what we were doing in Bloomington Richfield and part of the pre-work was uh, what funding source do you use for that? And so uh, along with providing results and what our program looked like, we had to look at where our money came from. And uh, I came, it was a realization to me, we used 12 different funding sources. 11 in addition to the $67 to make that happen. So we scaled back our program for about $5,500. We're getting similar results uh, uh, for our students. So that's a historical part. And of course, uh, we look at early childhood and integration as a system. Early childhood isn't a thing, but it's, it's a multitude of things that you do. So we start with our kids and our families at birth because we know the brain development starts then. And we say that all families uh, need to be working with their children. We have a screening as an important part of how we identify kids and refer them to the various programs. But as you can see on the early childhood end in Bloomington Richfield, this is all part of our early childhood system. So when you talk about alignment, you can't just talk about all oh, that four-year-old program needs to be aligned. No, all of your systems, early childhood, K-3, have to be aligned. So I, I encourage you to do that as you start this um, journey. I'm going to spend a little bit of time because it's the one that's gotten the most attention, and it's the biggest transformation we've made on our early childhood end, and that is like with uh, school readiness, K readiness, the... the uh, Anoka Hennon pro program, we started a specific program that we call Kinder Prep, and that's targeted at four-year-olds. We'd love to do it three and four, but we still have that money problem. So we're targeting at our most at-risk four-year-olds. And so we continue to have a program that serves uh, four-year-olds most at risk for not being ready for kindergarten, identified by screening and or by the fact that they have poverty and EL. And uh, through the years, the majority of those students have met both, bo met both of those markers. And we've built that program, and what I'd encourage all of you to do is uh, on some outcomes or some goals. You can't have this conversation and say, we're just gonna do pr good programming until you decide uh, where you wanna come out. I thank Senator Weger for asking the question, what is kindergarten ready? Because if you can't identify what is kindergarten ready, you can't have meaningful conversations with K-3, with early ed, about what the target is. And so in our Bloomington model, and again, uh, another great question, kindergarten isn't the end point, third grade isn't the end point, and if you can see this chart, in Bloomington, we tell teachers, administrators, community members, legislators, our goal is every single student, college and career ready. And on that pathway in Bloomington, we have some milestones that we want all students and each individual student to meet that milestone. So our conversations for our, our early childhood to three have centered around our ready for kindergarten milestone, which is the uh, very second one, having meaningful discussions about what that is and how we're going to measure that. So everybody is trying to get to that same marker. And of course, that is followed by that uh, very 
recognized uh, milestone of reading at third grade, at grade level by third grade. So those are two of our milestones that we could identify for everyone. With the help of Dave Heisted, uh, prior to that Jim Engemeyer and our uh, technology department, we now in Bloomington can for every individual family on their phone app, they can log into their student's uh, profile and they can map where their student is on this trajectory of college and career ready. So that at kindergarten, a parent can say, and of course there's a double-edged sword here, if you tell a parent your child is destined just to graduate and not be ready for a two-year college, a four-year co college, or Harvard, if you tell them that, they say, well, you're wrong. Well, the purpose is to have that conversation with parents so that we can change trajectories. So now every family can say each step of the pathway, including kindergarten and third grade, how is my student doing? Classroom teachers can say how are all of my students doing? And our system can say how are we doing for all students in our, in our district? Some of the quality alignment traps if you have a low quality K3 program or if you have a low quality uh, birth to three programming, doing more of it won't improve your results. And I think you heard some of the things that you need to do. There's all kinds of research about what good quality is. If you align bad quality to other bad quality, your results will be more bad quality. <laughs> so look at both ends of your, your spectrum and really take a hard look at what you're doing and take on some of the things that early learning can only be play. It can be play, but it has to be directional uh, play, uh, guided play with an outcome. The other thing that uh, both in Bloomington and Richfield, and I know by talking to other people that are partway down this journey, there will be a tendency for those of you that are in the K3 side that will step up to the plate and say, if those early childhood people only did it our way, we would fix it. And I can guarantee you on the early childhood side, there will be early childhood people saying, if those stupid K3 people only knew what we knew about early learning and did it our way, we would fix it. And neither of those work, and I think again, in Okahempin was a testimony, you need to get the people together to talk about that. You need to have your assessment people, your early childhood, your kindergarten teachers, your curriculum people, your principals, your district leaders in the same room saying, what is it we want to accomplish and what do we collectively have to change to make this better and align our work? And I'm sure there's people saying, nah, that won't happen in our district. I'll guarantee it to some extent it will. And then look at, uh, I encourage you to look at quality alignment as a process. Just like early childhood programming isn't a thing, there's lots of things we do in early childhood, there's lots of things we do in K3. It's not just instructions, instruction, it's parent engagement, it's family uh, support, it's the things, the barriers that get in the way of learning of kids that are in, in the gap. Uh, but look at it as a process. You can't fix all this, change all this at one, at one time. Set some goals and start the conversation because it's not going to get fixed on its own. Some of the organizational building blocks, you've heard them before. You need to have your administrative staff and your school board on board part of this conversation. This just isn't going to happen organically by uh, a, a bunch of teachers jumping out of their classroom one day and say, we're going to change our curriculum, how we teach, and and who we teach and, and when we teach it. We were fortunate in our school district that our school board uh, made it a priority. And they said, we want all children ready, just not those that get ready in the programming we have. We want the sort of programming and all of our kids so that they get ready. So uh, they put that out there as a challenge to us and they've been good at helping define some of those 12 funding sources to put additional resources to get this job done. And I said this, and I can't say it enough, uh, get your early childhood people, your K3 people, your assessment people, all the people doing the work together in the same room. Not just once, but on a regular basis. Figure out how to systematize that. 
some of the things that were uh, that we've had some focus on and 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 we're, we're happy about again the intensity matters uh, kids that are behind don't catch up by having only a little bit of time to catch up kids need time to learn uh, we had a particular focus on literacy and math if you don't do pre-literacy development guess what you won't get literacy you have to have a focus it can be through play but you have to have a literacy focus uh, probably don't need to I, I probably can't add anything about executive function uh, uh, for sure and that was prior to having the spike taken for all from my head but it is important and if you don't address that it's not going to get done we have a one of our uh, elementary principals right now that spends two weeks with kids that we haven't discovered because they moved in they spend two weeks getting ready for kindergarten all they look at is executive function that's all they do they don't look at a number they don't look at a letter some of the other uh, program things you've seen before uh, you'll probably hear about our family stars Academy from John Miller Hagen one of our principals and with that I will turn it over to Dave Heisted Some of you know that I, I worked in Minneapolis uh, before coming to my job in Bloomington, and I had the privilege of working with Ann Maston on the uh, homeless studies that uh, Philip mentioned. Um, along with that, I had a passion for early childhood. So uh, we developed direct measures of literacy and numeracy for the beginning of kindergarten in Minneapolis. At the same time, my my uh, companion, uh, uh, Jim Angermeyer, was doing the same thing for Bloomington. Uh, we presented last summer results of, uh, of uh, validity studies showing that those assessments predict third grade uh, literacy and numeracy um, on the uh, MCA assessments. And that's the kind of assessment I think that all districts should think about. Uh, the checklists that are out there are fine for certain purposes, especially the non-cognitive purposes. But if you want to know if kids are ready for uh, literacy and numeracy, you need a direct assessment. And so what we did in Bloomington was we did a, a efficacy study of the kinder prep program. Um, I took all the students that had been in the program prior to 2012, and I matched those students with uh, similar students that didn't get the program. So we matched on um, some relevant uh, variables, uh, including uh, special education, English language learner status, free and reduced lunch, racial, ethnic status, and gender. Um, and um, then I, I obtained the beginning of kindergarten total literacy and total numeracy scores uh, from the district uh, warehouse. So I'll just quickly go through. Um, you know, this uh, was the, I did a hierarchy so that I matched on the, um, the first four variables with virtually every single uh, student. There were a few that had different home languages or uh, boys and girls. Uh, uh, but basically, I, it was a very good match where uh, most uh, cases uh, I had six out of six variables matched. Um, Ninety pairs um, of students had six out of six variables that were identically matched, and 14 pairs had five out of six. There were a few kids that I couldn't match, and I took those out of the study. There are a number of different ways that you can do these kinds of studies. You can use propensity matching, but I found with sm relatively small groups of students you can and a diverse district of about the size of Bloomington or larger you can get a good match uh, identical students and here were the demographics of the students who only had one American Indian 38 African American Asian students Hispanic white students so you can see only seven percent of the population was white um, as Tom mentioned um, a high priority for students uh, in poverty and students who are English language learners for this program. And we had 104 total students. Here are all the languages. <laughs> it's kind of fun to see just how many different languages there were among this group. So it's not just Hispanic students, although 48% of the students were Hispanic, but all these other languages as well. 
Um, and then other demographics, 89% uh, were free and reduced lunch, 72% were the English language learners, 5% um, were receiving special education services when they hit kindergarten. These are all the demographics of the students when they hit kindergarten. And then we just looked at the total kindergarten uh, literacy score on the, on the uh, what's called the EKA in Bloomington, and found that there was a highly significant difference. Um, students, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, we kind of created this pathway analysis where we're pre predicting whether students are ready for third grade, and then we link up third grade with later middle school, and then we link up with college readiness scores. There's no way you can predict with accuracy from kindergarten to college readiness scores. Uh, but uh, but we did find that uh, students that were at about uh, a score of 80 would be on, on track for a four-year college if you did that trajectory. Uh, the students with about 40, 45 would be on track for a two-year college. So the match sample was more at a two-year college level if you wanted a reference to a, a standard. Um, the statistics were highly significant. The p-value was less than 0.001. Uh, which is highly significant. In math, we saw the same differences. It was statistically significant. It wasn't a, the mag same magnitude of difference. So in both um, math and uh, literacy, um, we saw a significant difference for the children that were in this high quality kinder prep program. We're going to continue to follow these kids, see how they do in first grade. We see a lot of studies where the initial differences fade by the time you get into first, second, and third grade. But I think with the RTI approaches being used in Bloomington to make sure kids don't fall through the crack, I think there's a good chance that these kids are going to be um, outperforming their, their control group comparison as we look forward. There's some caveats about this study. The one thing that I'd really love to have would be uh, preschool screening scores on all these students. We're working really hard as ANOCA is to get as many students as possible screened before age four. Ideally, I'd like it three or three and a half. Um, Bloomington now is using the beginning of kindergarten, I mean the um, uh, MIPCR, the Minneapolis Preschool Screening Instrument. Um, the team in Minneapolis uh, validated that assessment as predicting kindergarten readiness, and it would be a nice pretest. So you could actually do value added where you could control for prior uh, learning as well. So in the future, we hope to get uh, more and more of those students screened. Uh, there are some other variables that would be nice to have, like concentration of poverty, length of time in the country, family income, et cetera. So with any of these studies, the comparison is only as good as the variables that you can link on. And I'm going to be working on getting other variables. Um, next steps, we're going to follow students. We have now a first grade assessment for all students in Bloomington. We're using the um, map for primary grades. And so we're going to use that also for uh, evaluating the effectiveness of all day kindergarten. So I encourage people to to uh, invest in a beginning of kindergarten measure that could be used as, a, as an indicator of progress for preschool and then a baseline for showing progress from kindergarten to first to second, et cetera. So that's what I uh, prepared. And I think we're open for questions for any of the four of us. We have time for one question. Oh, so whoever puts their hands up, for, there we go. Some very <laughs> eager person back there. I will try to get there quickly. How are you? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Patricia Torres Ray. I'm the chair of the Education Committee in the Minnesota Senate, the Policy Committee. And Representative uh, Carlos Mariani and I have been reviewing the statistics uh, related to ELL children. And we're very alarmed about uh, what we see. So a couple of issues that we see. One is that uh, the majority of children are passing the WIDA test, the language test, yet they continue to be identified as ELL by the districts because they uh, do not they are not prepared and they do not have the academic and literacy language that they need. Yet the ELL 
training category or programming is not connected to pre-K third. So teachers uh, in the ELL programs feel left out of this conversation that we're having right now. Uh, they feel like they are doing separate work for the same population and that we have a fragmented system for a large group of kids. So we are very interested in introducing legislation to fix that and to increase resources for this population. And uh, we would like to hear from you if this is something that you are thinking about we need to do. And mostly to invite all of you because I am just delighted to see this large number of people here. Uh, we just had an ELL conference uh, this weekend with about you know the same number of teachers. So I am delighted to see the energy that uh, is uh, taking place right now. But we do need your help and your assistance in defining what we need to do next. That's uh, tremendous news, uh, Senator. Um, it, we need to do more of the longitudinal analysis of the ELL population. I presented to AMSD a few weeks ago an analysis that indicated that we did have some difficulty with getting students. We had a good initial growth on ELL students in Bloomington, but then things were tapering off in middle school. And there were a number of students that after five years were not close to the proficiency benchmarks, and even after seven years were not um, uh, close to the proficiency benchmarks. So it really calls on all of us to work together with that population. Uh, anything that adds more resources to this arena, <laughs> Lord knows we'd be happy to have it. I think in, in our district it is a process that we're working on now where we just hired an ELL coach who can work with some of our folks to strengthen our instruction in this arena. And clearly we don't have enough resources yet to do um, all that we need to do with some of these kids, but we are we are taking a stab at it to try to strengthen the, the instruction for those kids and their, their special learning situations. I want to thank our guests from Anoka Hennepin and Bloomington for their time. 